breakthroughs, I think, uh, recently have been in, in microbiology of caves. So really pleased that Hazel Barton's come over, talk us about starving in the dark, uh, uh, the microbiology of caves. Hazel, thank you. Okay, thank you to everyone. Um, for those of you who do not know me and might wonder why there is a yank at a British cave exploration, um, I'm actually from Bristol, as you can tell by the accent. Um, <laughs> Because you're a captive audience, um, I am, uh, I'm going to talk about the, the classic microbial ecology in caves. I thought I would, because I'm talking on Monday night, I thought I'd talk about the biospeleogenesis on Monday night and some of the work we've been doing on microbes forming caves. And it's also, I don't really want to, I, I just did a series of articles in Descent, and I don't really want to just reiterate what everybody hopefully read. Um, so I wanted to talk in maybe a little bit more detail about a couple of things that we're doing that are classic microbial ecology. Because um, we are, this is a, a 50th uh, anniversary, uh, I did put together some data on, on cave microbiology and, and the history of cave microbiology, at least as, as a science. Um, the first, the very first paper was published in like 1940. Um, up to about the 1970s, there really wasn't a lot published on cave microbiology. There was a blip in 67, and that's when someone discovered that histoplasmosis could be found in caves with guano. We heard a bit about that yesterday. Um, and so a lot of people rushed out and did the normal, we sampled this cave, and it also had it. Um, and because of this level of microbiology until the 1970s, our, our understanding of microbes in caves was based on cultivation. So the idea of cultivation is you take an agar plate into a cave, you streak something on it and see what grows. The trouble is that's a very selective process because our agar media has been developed for, for maybe human microbiology, that's where it's, it's born from, but also from looking at microbiology in soils. So you, you tend to bias the results. And what we came up with is the idea that my, caves were sterile, right? They're dark, there's no sunlight, they're geologically isolated, therefore they're sterile environments. And anything you find in there is a contaminant that's been brought in by a caver from the surface um, or an animal. Uh, so that was our, our level of understanding. And then if you think everything in a cave is just contamination, then it's really not that interesting to study. And that was the prevailing theory for a while. In 1997, uh, Norm Pace, if any of you are, are know Norm, who's a, a caver in, he lives in Colorado. Um, he was my postdoctoral advisor. He did the first molecular study in caves. And we can actually use the DNA with inside the microorganisms, much like a barcode. So just like if you get a can of beans at the grocery store, you don't actually have to have can of beans written on the side of it. If there's a barcode, you can scan it, and that will tell you what's inside the tin. And you can do the same with microorganisms. So we can use the ribosomal RNA, and these are just some structures. Um, this is from a bacterium, archaea, and this is a yeast. And you can see their structural differences, especially highlighted in the red areas, which are the areas we key on. So you can actually generate a small fragment of DNA and read it like a barcode. And then you can compare the differences between these barcodes. So um, you just take your microbes, look at the differences, create a genetic distance, and then you can start creating trees, right? It's like a family history. Who's the grandparents, great-grandparents, based on how that DNA is changing. When you do that, you end up with a big tree of life. So this is a tree that Norm generated in 1997. I'm going to show you the, the new version later. Um, and this tree basically changed our, this, sorry, I should say this is based on Carl Woese's work in 1977, but it changed our understanding of life on Earth. And instead of recognizing there were five kingdoms of life, so the animals, the plants, the fungi, the monora, the protista, we recognize there were actually three domains of life. So the bacterial domain, which you're probably all familiar with, bacteria to some extent, and that's where life evolved. The last common universal ancestor uh, was, a, was basically a protobacterium, and the bacteria grew out of that. About, I think somewhere on the order of, uh, I think I'm trying to remember the, the, the dates, but somewhere around 700 million to a billion years after the bacteria evolved, the archaea spun out of that. And that's a group that look very much like the bacteria on the outside, but they're also the extremophiles. These are organisms that produce the methane, they live in the hot springs, they like really strong acids. 
out of the archaea grew the eukarya, and that's the branch that we live on, the organisms with a, a nucleus, a eukaryotes. And the, the inside of our nucleus actually looks like an archaea. So there was maybe some kind of symbiotic relationship that led to the nucleated cells that we are today. So we are evolved out of archaea, archaea evolved out of bacteria. In this tree, um, we live right here. Homo sapiens uh, represent the animals, the zea, the plants, um, and the fungi right here. So this is the crown eukaryote. So this is animals, plants, and fungi. And you can see how evolutionary distant we are, like from a plant or a fungus. And then you look at some of these evolutionary distances. So there's a lot of diversity that we see within the microbial world. This point, break point here, everything on this side is macroscopic, so you can see it without a microscope, and everything on this side is microscopic. So the majority of diversity on Earth is microscopic, and it's also the majority of life on Earth. If you were to weigh all life that you could see versus all the life that you couldn't see, the life you couldn't see would be dominant. It's the dominant form of life on Earth, which is why you should study microbes. So when Norm started doing his um, molecular work, it's, it's quite hard to get DNA. Um, and the easiest way to do it is to find something that has a ton of DNA, something really snotty and obvious biofilmy hanging off in a cave like this. And you can scrape this off, bash it about, get the DNA out, and look at the, the microorganisms are there. So a lot of the work um, that emerged out of Norm's first study in here that's looking at these, these gunges, these big biofilms. I don't think anyone's done the, the mixing some bacteria. As, you did? did you, in the 80s, did you use the molecular? Yeah, so the, the, a, a true deep phylogenetic um, analysis was about in this region here. Um, and this is where I come in. This is not me. This is, um, I, I, my PhD is actually medical microbiology, but I'm a Mendip last. I grew up caving on Mendip, and I actually figured out I could go caving in the States while I was doing my PhD. And Norm is also a, a, a caver. He's a, a Lou Bicking Award winner. And I, he hired me to work on tuberculosis. And the reason I have a picture of a guinea pig is because to, uh, guinea pigs can't cough. So if you're going to work on tuberculosis, it's good to work with an organism that can't cough tuberculosis in your face. So that's why I work with guinea pigs. And the nice, the, the, the thing, this is it's like a weird segue, I know, but I had to, unfortunately, sacrifice these guinea pigs, take out their lungs, and then take the caseous lesion that was the tuberculoid plaque out of their lungs. So a caseous lesion is your immune system. When you have tuberculosis, it throws all this calcium at it to kind of block off the infection and try to save your life. And it doesn't work very well, which is why a lot of people buy, die from tuberculosis. But what I was doing, I was taking these things out that were the size of a pinhead and extracting the bacterial DNA out. And the trouble is calcium has an opposite charge to DNA, so DNA sticks very tightly to it. So I got extremely good at extracting tiny amounts of DNA from calcium-rich samples. And of course, the guinea pig thing didn't turn out to be interesting because surprisingly, we found tuberculosis in these tuberculoid plaques. But it meant that I had techniques to go somewhere in a cave and look for microorganisms in these calcium-rich environments. And no one had ever looked at a surface in a cave that didn't have obvious biofilms on it. So most people have been looking at caves with very obvious organic input, these hydrogen sulfide systems. No one had just gone into your random cave, scraped something off the wall to look to see what was there. When we did that, um, it turned out there was a massive amount of diversity. We were expecting that we would find one or two species that were highly specialized to live in that environment and not a lot going on. It's just you know, some random organism that's going to just you know, trace organics, live uh, eat that. We didn't find that. We found nine different phylum level groups of microorganisms or groups of bacteria. When I say phylum level, phylum is about equivalent to the distance between us and a plant. So there's nine groups of that genetic distance that we were finding on the walls of this cave. And that didn't make a lot of sense, but it's been seen before. Um, Hutchinson in the 1960s described the paradox of the plankton. And that's when you look at water, you can measure the plankton in the, the water, and you notice that 
as the nutrients become, become more limiting, the diversity of the plankton in that water becomes higher. And we don't know why that is. And I've actually, my lab has dedicated the last 15 years to trying to figure that out. Um, and in the process, we've found some really interesting things, how cave form, uh, caves form, microbes rule the world, that kind of thing. Um, this, is a, this is a picture that sums up 20 years of microbial ecology in caves. Um, it's not all my work. I, I mine the databases, and I think I pulled 23 different studies together that had been done in caves to create this. This is based on uh, modern sequencing approaches, and that's an Illumina uh, sequencing approach. And Illumina allows you to um, sequence very short pieces of DNA that you can reassemble. And I think you can get, when I started as a graduate student, it would take me a week to sequence 400 bases of DNA. I can put material in an Illumina sequencer and get seven billion pieces of DNA read in four hours. We have high-seq machines now that can read 300 billion bases of DNA. And you use that to assemble what the community structure looks like. What you find is there's 12 dominant phyla. So again, those phyla are kind of kingdom-level divisions. Phy uh, 12 dominant phyla. The gamma proteobacteria and actinobacteria tend to be the most dominant. And because this was so many studies, there's quite a lot of variability here. Um, the gamma proteobacteria depend a lot on those organics, the humic materials that are coming into caves, and they're variable based on the energy sources in the cave. Actinobacteria are the more interesting one. This is where the majority of our antibiotics come from, and I'll talk about that later. And again, this seems to vary depending on how close you are to the surface. If you're quite a shallow cave within 10 to 20 meters vertical from the surface, you tend to have a lot more soil organics, the same um, humic and fulvic acids that Fiona was talking about, and that will drive your actinobacterial population. The interesting thing here is this group here. There's 14 phyla here that you've probably never heard of, even if you were a um, microbiologist, and this is what we call the rare biosphere. These are those, those trace organisms that probably play a critical role in cave ecosystems, but we don't understand. And this is where a majority, I think, of the really interesting work in the next 10, 20 years is gonna occur. And there's also this unclassified group, and it's quite a high percentage, and you can see there's not a lot of variability in it. And that turns out to be a really important group. That's uh, something that we call microbial dark matter, and I'll talk a little bit that, about that in a minute. I know it's kinda cool, isn't it? It's, uh, it's American government speak. All right. So the study sites, um, <clears throat> I grew up in Mendip, epigenic caves. We're not that interested in epigenic caves because you have big rivers coming in, bringing lots of organic material. There's lots of exchange between the surface and the uh, underground ecosystem. I don't like those kind of caves for the microbiology I'm doing. I like to look at extreme starvation and extreme nutrient limitations. So I like big, deep, hypogenic caves. So we work in Lechigia Cave, and I've been very impressed with all the pronunciations I've heard of Lechigia over the last day and a half. Um, Lechigia Cave, Wind Cave in South Dakota, and Jewel Cave in South Dakota. And I noticed John had his, you know, the accumulated length of all the caves in um, the United Kingdom. So living in America for the last 20 plus years, I can't can't avoid a humble brag of how long our three cave systems are that we study. Okay, so resource competition. As I said, it's a nutrient-limited environment. It's very starved. How do you get nutrients? So there's a couple of different approaches you can do. One is you can be a competitor. So what you do is you fight to get these resources. In order to start this um, study, we actually had to have microorganisms in the lab that we could look at the mechanisms they use to fight. So this is a culture library from Lechigia Cave. So every one of these plates represents a unique species that was pulled out of Lechigia. The majority of what we find, there's a lot of endemism. They tend to be unique to these particular environments. Lechigia has been isolated from the surface for over four million years. So we get some really weird phenotypes that we absorb in these organisms. This is one of the, the weird phenotypes that caught my eye. And I, I had this in the Descent article. So you can see a colony here of the bacterium, and this is an actinobacteria and it had these crystals in it. And of course, being a geomicrobiologist, I'm like, crystals, fantastic. There's iron reduction or iron oxidation. There's something crazy going on here. 
we uh, had a student sit, sit there with a, a needle and pick these things out of the agar for weeks. We had enough, we could do an x-ray powder diffraction on it, and it turned out to be iodinin. And iodinin is an antibiotic. So when this microbe grew, this is a starved plate. We starved it for resources, and when it grew in this starvation, it produced so much antibiotic, it spontaneously crystallized in the media. So the thing to remember about antibiotics, and we're from the, we come from the country of Fleming, is that they all come from other microorganisms. I think 99.8% of all the antibiotics that have been used and are in the antibiotic pipeline right now, which means they're coming along to become drugs, come from other microorganisms. They're either directly produced by that more microorganism or they are a um, semi-synthetic, which means that we've chemically modified them to make them more effective. So this is why we look for antibiotics and microorganisms. So it's quite interesting. Okay, you've got a cave bug that's just pumping these things out. So that got us interested in the idea of, of hunting for antibiotics in these microorganisms in caves. We had a collection of microbes from Lechigia. We screened 90 of them for antibiotics. And the antibiotic hit rate, which means the likelihood of finding a novel antibiotic from a group of microorganisms is about one in 10,000. And we screened 90 and we found this, this thing, lechamycin. So this is work with a collaborator of mine, Brian Backman at Vanderbilt University. So there was a much higher, either there's two things that happened. One, we happened to pick the right bug and put it in the right place, or there's a higher hit rate for these uh, antibiotics. And it turns out that Brian actually has an active lab that looks at novel antibiotics from microorganisms, and there are a higher percentage of antibiotics in caves. And this seems to make sense. There's, a, there's an evolutionary precedent for this, uh, which is called the, the Red Queen hypothesis, and we're also the land of queens, right? Um, so the Red Queen hypothesis comes from Alice in Wonderland, and it's based on a, um, a quote that the Red Queen tells Alice. Now, here, you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. And the Red Queen hypothesis is used to describe social conflict as a driver of evolution. So the idea is that the harder you fight, the more pressure is going to be put on you to evolve to stay competitive. And we're wondering if this applies to antibiotics uh, in caves. You have limited resources. You have to fight to get those into resources, so there's a lot of evolutionary pressure for you to make novel antibiotics. It's really hard to screen for antibiotics. To the chemistry behind finding a novel antibiotic is very, very difficult. That microorganism that we found the, the um, novel antibiotic in actually made 38 antimicrobial compounds, so it was a highly, highly competitive organism. Rather than keep screening a large library, we started working with Brian Backman at Vanderbilt uh, at McMaster University to look at what they were resistant to. So rather than look for novel antibiotics, let's see what they're resistant to. So we took that same 90 microbes from Lechigia and we exposed them to every antibiotic that's used in the clinic. So these are either used for, where is it? this is for gram-positive organisms and this is for gram-negative organisms. And this is looking up the scales from zero to 100 what percentage of that 90 are resistant to the antibiotic? And you can see they're resistant to practically everything. The only things they are not resistant to are vancomycin and semi-synthetics. And that makes sense. They would never have seen a semi-synthetic drug in a cave because microbes make native natural antibiotics. So this kind of threw everybody for a loop when we published this because it suggested that the microbes in this isolated cave deep underground, four million years isolated from the surface, were resistant to practically every antibiotic that we use in the clinic. And as everybody knows, antibiotic resistance evolved because we've been using antibiotics. And what this argued was against that, what it argued was that antibiotic resistance is a very ancient process. It's evolved at least four million years ago. If you look at the structure of some of those antibiotics, they don't form in a few years. It probably took a billion years of evolution for these microorganisms to develop some of these more complex structures. 
So if the Red Queen hypothesis holds true, if you have a billion years of evolution of antibiotics, you should have a billion years of evolution of resistance. We took the one bug that made uh, a lot of antimicrobials and we screened it, and it turned out that it was resistant to 26 different classes of antibiotic, one microorganism. Everybody was like, you know, squealing, like, oh my God, we've, we've pulled a superbug out of the cave, the Andromeda strain, it's gonna kill everybody. We do keep it behind two locked doors, um, and when people ask for this strain, it's kind of, we can't give you that. Um, it has nine novel pathways of antibiotic resistance, and obviously we don't want that getting to clinic because that means that nine antibiotics we use right now, there's gonna, they're gonna be less useful. Um, but, but the important thing that we pulled out of it was that some of these novel pathways have not been seen in the clinic. So this is one of the novel mechanisms of antibiotic resistance. So this is um, the antibiotic telithromycin, and this is what telithromycin looks like before you expose it to the bug. Here's an E. coli um, grown on an agar plate with a, a little disc of telithromycin on the plate, and you can see the E. coli won't grow anywhere near it because it's an antibiotic. We take the gene that makes this Lechagia strain resistant to lithromycin, put it in the E. coli, and you can see the E. coli will grow right up to the antibiotic. And they do that because they phosphorylate. There's a phosphorylation here that changes the structure of this antibiotic so it can no longer bind the target in the, um, in the E. coli. The thing is, by understanding what this process looks like now, it's possible to figure out what antibiotic resistance might look like when it emerges in the clinic. So it's usually, you know, when you see these things, there's usually a 20 to 30 year lag this is not, so this might seem like, well, why do we care about that? And it's not an unprecedented approach. If any of you have taken Augmentin, um, it is basically penicillin, it's ampicillin. And ampicillin is basically useless as a drug right now. Resistance to it is everywhere. Augmentin contains clavulanic acid. And clavulanic acid is made by another microorganism to inhibit the resistance to ampicillin. So if you give someone ampicillin, the microbe makes resistance, ampicillin doesn't work. So you give ampicillin along with clavulanic acid, clavulanic acid inhibits that inhibitor, and then ampicillin works again. So by seeing what some of these processes look like, we can actually start to develop those inhibitors. So the Red Queen hypothesis is true. If you make a bigger mouse, better mouse, better mousetrap, the idea is there should be just as many inhibitors of resistance in that cave environment as the antibiotics, as the antibiotic resistant pathway. So uh, this is what we're working on in the lab right now. It's not all fighting and arguing with each other. There is some resource co cooperation. This is one of our sample sites. Um, I know everybody was complaining about how cold it was yesterday. It was minus 17 when I took this photo. Um, and we were sampling, this is uh, outside of Wing Cave, National Park, and we were sampling some wells. We had to do some control uh, measurements. We were sampling some wells, and we turned this well on, and there was a lot of hydrostatic pressure, and it threw water in the air 10 meters, and then it came down as ice and covered us in ice while we were sampling, so it's not all fun and games. This is where South Dakota is, this red box. It's the Black Hills of South Dakota. It's famous for some very big, long caves. This is Wing Cave National Park. Um, I think Jewel Cave National Park is right around here. Uh, the, the Black Hills are a, an up, uplift, um, and so you have these deeper limestone levels uplifted and exposed. The top was taken off by erosion, it exposes this Madison aquifer, uh, Madison limestone. Water drains in, creates the Madison aquifer. One of the biggest aquifers in the United States. Uh, it flows, there's multiple uh, infeeders, but it flows from Wyoming around below the Black Hills and then basically these states here. Wing Cave is one of the longest caves in the world. I think it's the fifth longest cave in the world. Has two natural entrances. One is right there and there's another one right there. Um, for the tourists, there's an actual elevator because the natural entrance is quite small. Uh, the interesting thing about Wing Cave is that it's a very ancient cave. The first phylogenetic um, processes in there are almost 300 million years old. It's been burrowed and, and re-excavated. But it follows 
the, the Black Hills kind of down through the Madison and actually intersects the current water table. So you can actually travel through the cave and get to the water table. It's about, depending on, on how fast you are, it's anywhere from a two to four hour trip from the elevator down through here. And you're basically walking down dip through the cave to hit these lakes. And these lakes here are not like a classic lake you might see in a cave um, where you've got uh, Vedo's zone water kind of working into the phreatic zone. These are the surface of a water table. And the lakes go up and down depending on where the piezometric surface of that water table is. It's very ancient water. The water approaches 50,000 years in age in places. And we wanted to look at the microbiology. Getting there is not, this is my postdoc. Um, I don't make all my postdocs cave shirtless. Um, he wouldn't fit with his shirt on, so we had to take it off. And there's a lot of, uh, I got my five minute warning. Uh, there's a lot more like this. So getting sampling equipment down there was, was a trick. We have a, a group of Sherpas the Park Service provides for us. Um, and then you get to the lakes. And we sampled the microbiology of the lakes. We, we were having a hard time getting the DNA out. Um, and we decided to do cell counts. And we, it turns out that the number of cells per mil in Wing Cave is the lowest of any body of water that's been measured on Earth. The only place on Earth with fewer cells per mil is Lake Vostok in Antarctica, and that's just the accretion ice that they've been able to collect. Every other oligotrophic, like low nutrient, low energy system that's been measured had much, low, uh, much higher levels of bacteria. Um, Seawater, kind of seawater you can see through is usually about a million cells per meal, and we, ha we have 3.2 thousand, so incredibly low. We filtered this, um, just to give you an idea of the size we filter, you can see pollen. We're filtering in the 0.2 micron range because that's the theoretical limit for life. Um, when we did that, we've got a lot of diversity. We've got 17 different represented phyla, and you can see these are controls to make sure that we're not contaminating our samples. And I've left this blank for a reason, and that's because we accidentally took the wrong filter that was a 0.1 micron. So we've been filtering this lake for multiple years. We took a 0.1 micron filter, and we collected the filtrate, imagining it would be exactly the same. And what we saw was a big change in this group. If you remove this group right here, the distribution you see here is almost exactly the same as this. This group was unclassified. If you enter the DNA into a database using those barcodes, it comes back with nothing. It can't be identified. This is that microbial dark matter. We're working with the Joint Genome Institute right now, and they've done single cell sequencing, which means they isolate individual bacteria and sequence their genomes. They think this dark matter yield might be more like 40%. So up to 40% of the bacteria in this deep, isolated aquifer, karst aquifer, appears to be unclassified and unknown to science. We're trying to understand it. Oh, yes, and it's also below the theoretical limit of life. Um, it belongs in this group right here. This is a candidate radiation. This is the new tree of life. We're up to 152 uh, phyla within the bacteria. This is 35 phyla, which we have no um, candidate cultured microorganisms for. It's the microbial dark matter. It appears to be one of the more dominant forms of life on Earth that we currently know nothing about. So Wing Cave is going to be a critical environment in which to study this. Just last couple of slides in my last minute. We, um, this is Jewel Cave. This is a 2015 map. Uh, there's a lot more added out here, maybe about another 20 miles of cave added out here. Um, and it also follows down dip. And they found this. There's almost 200 miles of cave in Jewel Cave, and they've never found a lake until they found this. It's 17 hours from the entrance to get to this point, and they want us to go do the microbiology. So we're going to look at this and see if we find the same microbial dark matter that we find at Wing Cave, and this might give us some really important information about microorganisms in these deep karst aquifers and how they work together to get nutrients to survive. Caves, uh, <clears throat> really important microbial environment, really important to study. When I started this, there were five labs studying cave microbiology. The last census I did for the ICS, I think it's 37 labs now. They're geologically isolated. They're extremely nutrient limited. They're physically stable and they're limited exposure to anthropogenic chemicals. And I say, these are not those epigemic caves. These are these deep isolated caves we study. 
I could give a 30-minute presentation on why that's all critical to microbiologists to study. And I just want to thank uh, my research group. I have a big research group of uh, PhD master students. If anyone's looking to do a PhD or a postdoc, please let me know. Um, and we are funding the nice, one of the reasons that my lab is in the US is a funding, and we've been very successful in the past. So thank you. Thanks very much, Hazel, and uh, uh, spot on time.